Okay, so let's get started with part two of our survey of our organisms. And so we've moved on from archaea, and now we want to look at bacteria. Now, just to quickly kind of review this, we've looked at only four specific phyla that are currently established or studied in this domain. So for domain archaea, we looked at clean archaeota, urea archaeota, nano archaeota, and core archaeota. And that's the information you need to know for this portion of the exam. However, as we move in into the actual bacterial portion, you'll notice that again, there's far more phyla available and lots more information. Now, most of these guys have been studied or possibly even poorly studied, but we're only gonna focus on a certain set that are relevant to us in our field, whether medically or some sort of environmental impact, they have some sort of industrial impact or something of that sort. So I've kind of highlighted them in there and I've also kind of color coded them based on their uh, gram designation as well. So the ones that are, are appearing in bold, really those are the ones we're gonna be focusing, focusing on here. And so what we're doing is we're taking about 13 different phyla that we're interested, and I'll probably add a couple of here and there just simply because they're kind of interesting. Um, listening, there's uh, classes that we're interested in looking into and any particular notes uh, that you should probably know about. For example, one of the bigger groups that we're going to be studying in are going to be our proteobacteria. And our proteobacteria is probably the largest group of organisms that we're going to be looking at. And they are classified, or subclassified, I should say, into actual classes that are, have Greek letters. And so there's an alpha proteobacteria group, a beta proteobacteria group, and so on and so forth. And then under each of those, there are definitely highlighted organisms that you probably should know. Now, again, reminding you, you're not required to memorize any of the names. Simply, these are examples that I provide you, so you can kind of have an idea of you know, why these groups are of, of particular impact or importance. So if you want to know them, great. I'll use them in the exam as examples. You don't need to memorize those terms. So proceeding on, this is the overall breakdown of the kind of list that I just showed you earlier, right? So the classifications that we're gonna look at, we're gonna start off with a group called the deeply branching bacteria. We're gonna look at both types of content of GC, high and low. We're gonna look at the proteobacteria. And then we're gonna look at a small kind of subset group off to the side. So we're gonna proceed virtually in that order to cover all the material we need to know about bacteria by itself. So let's start with the deeply branching. So you'll notice I have that code uh, colored in green which means it's a classification. It's not a taxonomy, it's not a taxon, it's not a hierarchical organization. This is just one of those things we use to kind of sort things out. In other words, back to our examples previously, of we sort things based on color, we sort things based on wings or tails or whatever it is, that's all that color green is telling us right now. This is not a taxon, this is not part of the whole domains, kingdoms, phyla, and so on and so forth. So what are deeply branching? Um, and then their cousins over here, phototrophic. The term deeply branching comes from the fact that these are organisms that are related to the oldest organisms that we know. So the term deeply branched, meaning that it's part of those branches that go all the way back in the genealogy or the phylogeny of these particular organisms. So virtually, they're very much alike, like the earliest set of bacteria that we've discovered or we've described. Most of them are autotrophs. And again, they utilize inorganic substances to produce their materials. And very similar to our archaeans, they, typic they typically live in uh, habitats or locations that are pretty extreme per se. So again, all these places that resemble primitive earth. So places that are really, really hot, really, really uh, under high pressure, really salty, really acidic, and so on and so forth. Very similar to our archaea. And so under this group of deeply branching classifications, we actually do have two taxa. These are the taxonomy portions. So you'll notice that they're labeled in purple to identify phylum and class, and then in orange to give you the actual names you're supposed to know. So the first one is uh, phylum aquifici. So that C is not a, uh, pronounced like a hard K. And under it is class aquifex. And the example that I'm showing you over here on the right-hand side as well is an organism you don't need to memorize, but it's really cool, kind of cool, and it represents that particular phylum. It's called Aquifex pyrophilus. And so one of the reasons why we look at this guy is simply because, again, 
This is the prime example of what bacteria used to look like millions of years back. Now, Aquifex paradophilus happens to be a chemoautotroph, uh, happens to be hyperthermophilic, again, reminding you of these kind of extremophiles, and it also happens to be anaerobic, keeping in mind that, again, this oxygen present in our environment, which we'll talk about in a moment, is more of a, a recent development. So there was plenty of organisms that survived without the oxygen. So like Aquifex here, it's an anaerobic organism. So you're not required to know that example, but you're required to know the uh, phylum aquifici class Aquifex simply because again, they resemble our earliest bacteria. And these are model examples of what we study in microbiology. Now it's cousin, we already talked about a little bit um, earlier in the previous set of courses, this is phylum Deinococcus thermus, which has a class called Deinococci. Now, why do we look into this one? This happens to be another one of those similar kind of extremophile type organisms. And the example you're seeing on the uh, image in a moment is uh, Deinococcus radiodurans, this guy over here, which happens to be extremely resistant to high amounts of radioactivity. So this is the one we had described earlier when we talked about uh, San Onofrio, for example. And so what's interesting about this guy, though, is that it does seem to have uh, a double wall or gram-negative wall. But for some reason, when people stain it, it appears gram-positive. We're not quite sure why it does that. So, But the idea is, again, this is a unique organism simply because, again, early type organism, but extremely uh, resistant to these kind of early stages of the planet, extremely resistant to temperatures as well as radioactivity. So those are the two kind of um, highlights of this particular uh, classification of deeply branching organisms. And I'm not gonna joke to you, believe it or not, they used to call Deinococci, or in this case, Deinococcus thermus, or Deinococcus radiodurans, they used to call them Conan the bacterium, if you wanna look that up. It's pretty entertaining. So anyway. Continuing on, we're gonna look at the phototrophic bacteria. And so you'll notice that, again, it's in green. It's just a classification, just meaning that these are the organisms that use sunlight or light as a source to produce their energy, right? These also happen to be autotrophic. And so what's unique about these guys is these are the ones that possess early versions of what chloroplasts used to be. So these are the parents to those cells that eventually give you chloroplasts. And so these are called photosynthetic lamellae. And so in their membranes or parts of their membranes, they have structures that resemble chloroplasts and therefore have chlorophyll in there. And they can actually use sunlight as a way to produce energy and food. And so usually we kind of sort these guys out based on the colors that they actually reflect or refract technically. And so what we're gonna do is kind of look at some of these right now really quick. And then some of them we're going to kind of look at when we look at the protobacterial classification or taxonomy. So there's uh, five organisms that are kind of of interest here, but there's only four phyla that we're going to look at. And so the first phylum and its class is called cyanobacteria. The second one is chlorobi. The third one is called chloroflexi. But the fourth phylum, this is the one we're going to look a little bit later. That's that largest group that I was talking about uh, earlier. And so we'll come and look at this guy again a little bit later. So let's start with the first three in this case. So focusing just on the top three, uh, we're gonna look at phylum in this case, cyanobacteria. So you'll notice that the uh, taxon is in purple and the actual term is in orange. Now cyanobacteria are often called blue gene, uh, blue green bacteria or blue green algae is the other term you'll hear about them. They all mean the same thing. They're uh, referred to as cyanobacteria. These are all gram-negative organisms and then come in all sorts of cool little shapes. Most of them are circular, most of them are cocci, but they do come in some really cool shapes. They all divide by binary fission and they possess chlorophyll. Like I said, these are the earlier versions of what chloroplasts eventually become. And so what's unique about them is that means that they make these organisms oxygenic meaning that these organisms produce oxygen, right? And so the reason why we highlight these guys more than anything else is that these are the organisms that are responsible for really allowing us to breathe oxygen eventually. These organisms eventually grew so much 
that they literally transformed the entire planet to be oxygenic. They actually made it have that 20% or so oxygen all over the planet so that you and I can breathe. So without cyanobacteria, we really wouldn't be here, okay? Now, another unique feature about cyanobacteria is that they possess uh, little structures or specialized structures called heterocysts that also allow them to fix that nitrogen that is in our air. So not only do they produce the oxygen that we need, but they also uh, contribute to the fixed nitrogen that we need to survive. So very, very handy guys that we have over here. And typically you can always identify them by their stereotypical color green, just like any other plant that you've seen in the past, simply because of the presence of that chlorophyll in those photosynthetic lamellae, you can actually see their nice and neat color green. Okay. And then if you kind of pay attention to them a little bit more, you'll see these heterocysts, the ones that fix nitrogen, simply because they look a little bit larger and a little bit thicker in terms of their membranes out there. So this is why we pay attention to this guy. This is why cyanobacteria and that phylum happen to be very, very critical for us. Now, moving on to the next group, uh, there's another set of classification in which we kind of combine them all together. Um, and these are what we call the green and purple type bacteria. And the reason why we have those terms is simply because of the pigments that they produce, the colors that they actually end up producing. And so they possess, or they happen to possess, something called bacteriochlorophyll. So it's not the same thing as chlorophyll, in which chlorophyll is what we apply to plants or cyanobacteria. Bacteriochlorophyll, on the other hand, happens to be anoxygenic, meaning it, it is used for them to get, create their own energy, but they do not yield oxygen as their byproduct. Cyanobacteria does, but these guys don't. And so these guys end up producing other substances. So what can those substances be? Well, the term anoxygenic, in this case, implying that no oxygen is produced, they have to produce something else. Um, and in particular, more than anything else, sulfur happens to be one of the bigger ones that they can produce. So they're sulfurogenic, if you want to find a term to use, if you will. And they can produce other substances like methane and a couple of other examples. So we divide them into what we call the green and purple versions. And then we also divide them into the sulfur and non-sulfur versions. Now, for those of you who are kind of keeping tabs on this and reminding you again that oxygen happens to be that terminal electron acceptor that we talked about before, that important thing that we use for breathing, right? Well, if you look at the periodic table, you'll notice that sulfur is really close to oxygen. And so that it's used for the same concept. Sulfur happens to be also electronegative, and so it can also capture electrons, and so it can also serve as a terminal electron acceptor. And so instead of using oxygen, these guys use sulfur. So instead of these organisms producing water as a byproduct, they produce hydrogen sulfide as a byproduct. And so they usually have these typical colors and interesting smells also once they produce this, these sulfur deposits. So usually you can identify them by what colors they are kind of uh, reflecting or refracting. And so depending on what they produce and where they produce it. So for example, the sulfur versions of these, if they kind of release the sulfur on the outside of the organism itself, so they secrete it, they produce it and leave it outside, the organism in itself ends up staying kind of looking green, thanks to that bacterial chlorophyll. But if they keep the sulfur deposits inside of their cells, that color purple uh, is a result of that sulfur and that green kind of combining together. So depending on where they release it, they get different kind of cool colors. And so there's a couple of different examples that I can show you for those guys. Uh, they're under these so-called green reps. Um, and now keep in mind, these are colorized, so don't think that they're actually these colors. The bottom one is their actual color. And what you're seeing here are organisms chlorobi, and the bottom one is chloroflexi, which is the more kind of stringy one looking down there. And uh, the top one doesn't really move. It just kind of uh, leaves it so far on the outside and stays there. But uh, chloroflexi, on the other hand, actually kind of swims around. So you can usually find these guys kind of uh, worming around, if you will. Now for the purple versions of these, we will take a look at them when we look at the proteobacteria. bacteria. So kind of hold on to that thought too. All right, so that's kind of the deeply branching classification. Those are the phototrophic ones. Those are the ones that are using sunlight as a way to kind of produce their own energy and their own food. And that's it, that's the highlights of those. Now, the bigger groups that we're gonna look at are the classification called the uh, GC ratio ones. So the ones that have either high amounts of GCs in their DNA or lower amounts of GC in their DNA. Uh, 
That's what we studied in topic uh, D when we looked at the central dogma. This is one of the ways we classify our organisms based on how many guanines and cytosines they actually have within their DNA. So we're going to divide those into two big categories, the low GC content and the high GC content. Okay. And here's where some of our classification has changed a little bit simply because your book doesn't have the latest classification. So I'm showing you the actualized information here. So um, on the low GC content, we're going to take a look at two large phyla. And these are known as the Firmicutes and the Tenericutes. So you can laugh at the names if you want to. That's their actual names. And then under the high GC content version are the actinobacteria. And under there, there are several different re representatives that we're really interested in looking at. So I'm going to start with the low GCs. And then we're going to look at these particular groups and some of the representatives. And then we're also going to look at in there uh, the Tenericutes simply because this guy has been reclassified. The mycoplasmas used to be part of the Firmicutes group, but now they belong to their own phylum. So this is why we need to kind of keep on you know, track on these updates of classification. All right, so let's get started with the uh, low GC content versions. Okay, so you'll notice again, it's not a taxonomy, it's not a taxon, okay? It's just a classification, it's in green. So the phylum that we're interested in looking over here first are, is gonna be our Firmicutes. And we're going to look at the very first group of them called the clostridial group. Then we'll look at just regular rod looking ones and then some cocci or spherical looking ones. And then eventually we'll highlight again uh, the mycoplasmas. Okay. So on the right hand side is what you're going to see is pretty much the properties and the unique information that I need you to know. And on the left side, usually I'll just kind of leave the taxonomy and classification just for your reference there. Okay, so just hold on to this information. That's the part that you're really wanting to memorize. And anything in here that I kind of write in blue, those are the properties you need to know. And then usually either on the same slide or right after, I'll give you some images and some references. Okay, so let's start with the very first uh, phylum of interest, which is going to be Firmicutes. And the very first group of organisms that we're going to look at called the Clostridial group. And so Clostridial groups uh, represent a specific type of organism called Clostridium more than anything else, not always, but mostly, which happen to be all gram-positive organisms. They all happen to be kind of rod-shaped almost, so they're kind of tubular. And uh, these are all obligate anaerobes, meaning that oxygen kills them, okay? And what's very unique about them, the same stuff that we did in the lab, they're capable of forming these so-called endospores, these structures that are designed to kind of hold them and keep them and trap them and save them from really harsh conditions. So they kind of cocoon themselves, if you will, and protect themselves from the environment. So from heat, from starvation, from desiccation, and so on and so forth. And those are the structures we we're looking at when we did the endospore stain. So when you guys added specifically the malachite green, that's the uh, structure you were looking for, the endospores that they could form. So now, why do we look at these guys? This is one of the more important portions. Is because these organisms have two full kind of hits. They are important medically speaking, as well as to uh, industrial applications, okay? And more than anything else, the industrial application is more important simply because of those endospores. Because these guys can kind of cocoon themselves and save themselves for very long, long extended periods of time, that makes it very difficult to deal with, especially if we're trying to get rid of them. So what we're going to look at here are some of the examples. Again, you're not required to memorize any of the names, but usually talking about the names is what helps us understand why clostridial groups, as well as the, this phylum, happen to be very important to us, medically speaking. This is really where the medical micro part comes into play. Okay, So let's start with our very first group of clostridium. And so here, we'll introduce to you just by images, and um, I'll tell you a little bit of the story. We're looking at Clostridium tetany. And so here, uh, we're representing something that in history we've known for quite some time. Uh, most of you know this as tetanus. Now, uh, tetanus uh, starts with this interesting uh, symptom called trismus, what most people have heard as lockjaw in the past, which is characterized by kind of rigidity and spasms of all skeletal muscle for a few minutes. And it can last weeks and they can get so violent that at times it can break even bones. 
uh, part of the infection of Clostridium tetany can also include things like your classic fevers and sweatings, headaches, all of these other things. But one of the uh, additional kind of uh, interesting factors because of its tweaking the muscles is uh, this effect that it, uh, causes this kind of something called droopy eyes. And so not only does it kind of uh, lock the muscles so much that eventually we can't kind of use them anymore, but kind of off to the side, something that uh, you'll see kind of appear in people's faces all are these uh, kind of muscle locked features that prevent them from actually either smiling or speaking or even relaxing and kind of something cr uh, clenching their teeth so much that they crack them. So it can get fairly violent in terms of what it, uh, what it causes. Now, most of the time you can find uh, Clostridium tetany uh, in the GI tracts of most animals, for example, um, but you can find it in the soil simply uh, because of these feces and sometimes because it can be carried in manure or even possibly in the saliva of certain animals and it gets kind of passed on. Now, bacteria, uh, the Clostridium bacteria in this case, only gets into us through breaks in the skin. It doesn't suddenly just kind of land on you and cause these effects it has to hit you through some sort of access, through some sort of breakage of your skin more than anything else. And so that means you have to acquire from some contaminated object. It doesn't quite just hit you per se. And so um, most of you are kind of familiar with the concept of tetanus simply because people talk about tetanus for something uh, when they contract it from uh, infected pieces of metal, rusty metal usually is the case. And the relationship here is what makes us the microbiologists versus everybody else that just talks about tetanus. See, for those of you who might remember, tetanus is not a disease technically. Tetanus is an AMP term. Tetanus is the term we use when we have this kind of simultaneous um, action, uh, action potentials from your muscles all having to something called summation. For those of you who remember looking at muscles and sliding filament theory, you learn that your muscles, as they start firing, they start kind of adding the effect to each other and eventually you get such a summation effect or an addition effect of your muscles, your twitches also contracting, that you get something called tetanus. And so every single time you close your hand, you walk or whatever it is, and you're contracting those muscles, that is called tetanus in and of itself. But here, we've kind of extended the meaning of the word tetanus to more or less mean now not relaxing ever, right? And so this happens because of this organism producing something called a tet toxin, okay? And so it produces its own little toxin that causes this, uh, our muscles, the inability to relax. Now, for those of you who remember your AMP again, muscles relax because of energy. Remember, most people kind of have this uh, belief per se that uh, muscles need energy to kind of contract. That's quite the opposite. Muscles don't need energy to contract. Muscles usually just need calcium to contract. Muscles need ATP to relax, to release that sliding filament and then can do it again. And so what this TET toxin actually does, a Clostridium tetany does, is interferes with that particular portion. It prevents the uh, attachment of ATP and so it prevents the muscles from relaxing. So they end up in this kind of clenched state or contracted state, all right? So, the danger here is obviously getting kind of uh, cut by rusted metal kind of concept, but the part that you need to take away from this is also the fact that these are anaerobic organisms. And so to remind you again, they don't like oxygen, oxygen kills them. So they can't really be outside in the world. They have to be hidden in places. Rust happens to be that perfect place. Remember exactly what we're talking about for our electronegative uh, elements? So oxygen happens to be one of those very destructive type elements that likes to steal electrons. So when it lands on metal, for example, it rusts it. Well, it just so happens that that rust happens to be the perfect anaerobic environment for a clostridium. So that's why it hides in there. That's where that threat comes of, oh, if you got stabbed by a rusty nail kind of thing, that's where that origin comes from. Rusted metal happens to be very anoxygenic, sorry, anaerobic. Not a lot of oxygen in there. The bacterium can hide in there. Now you get poked, you get cut, you get stabbed by this particular metal, and now you introduce it to your body. Now it has to go inside of you for it to start growing. Remember, it requires an anaerobic environment. So if it lands on your skin, it's just gonna die. Oh, plenty of oxygen present there. It has to puncture 
your skin in this case, okay? So this is why there's no person-to-person -person transmission. You can't give somebody tetanus. You have to be stabbed by something that contains tetanus, right? Now, thankfully, we've actually had a vaccine for like 80 years now, if I remember correctly, um, simply because of the fact of the effects. But more than anything else, it does have about a 10% fatality rate. So it does kill one out of 10 people. So it's kind of important to make sure you're familiar with uh, some of these statistics, but also to how to take care of yourself. Now, the only reason why this pops up these days is simply because of people that are uh, inadequately immunized. So if you haven't been vaccinated for, uh, for tetanus, that's usually when people get these type of uh, diseases and these types of effects. If you've been vaccinated, you're pretty much good to go. Nothing to worry about here. So that's one short story of Clostridium that why we pay attention to these guys, right? Now, probably even better, uh, is gonna be the next example that I wanna give you guys. It's cousin Clostridium perfringens. And so Clostridium perfringens, same concept, same organism, same phylum, same type of uh, effects here. And so here what we're seeing is one type of uh, disease that's even a little more inter entertaining here. Um, in this case, anybody recognize this guy? Not quite flesh eating, but close. This is gangrene. In particular, a specific type of gangrene called wet gangrene. There's other things called gas gangrene and things like that too, in case you're wondering. Right? Now, wet gangrene happens to be this interesting kind of uh, concept in which clustering perfringens, again, still clostridium, happens to also get into your flesh, but it starts eating you from the inside out. Remember, these are anaerobic organisms. So if they get exposed to oxygen, they kind of die. So this is the issue that causes them to be uh, relatively uh, uncontrolled because we don't see it until it's too late. Since it's kind of destroying you from the inside out, you don't see it until the tissue starts necrotizing and dying. And at that point in time, it's too late because now that it's reached the outside, it dies on its own too. However, something very unique about this is again, we know that they're anaerobic, obligate anaerobes. So that means that if we detect this early on, we can actually bathe this with oxygen. So in other words, we can have oxygen therapy if you wanna think about it that way, not the one you breathe, but the one you apply to this. So you can actually kind of add higher amounts of oxygen to these areas in hopes of kind of drowning out uh, clustering perfringence and killing it. And it seems to be extremely effective. There's only one side effect to this. It's pure oxygen, which means that there's the danger of igniting in the event that there's any sparks or flames around that. So you have to be careful with that kind of treatment version of that. Now, with its cousin, we're going to talk about its other cousin, in this case, another clostridium uh, called clostridium botulinum. And so here, you'll notice that effect, there's two uh, clear effects that I'm gonna talk about here and highlight in them. Clostridium botulinum produces a toxin called bot toxin. So the tetanus one causes tet toxin, this one causes a bot toxin for BOT. Now, same idea here, very anaerobic, and so it's very, very unique that you, found it in, uh, you find it in environments that are uh, low oxygen and no oxygen. One of them happens to be canned goods. Most of your canned goods, when they're prepared, they are kind of um, sealed in a vacuum. So they remove a lot of the oxygen present. So cluster in your botulinum can hide in there, perfectly speaking. You know, no issues there. It has a happy environment, it can grow. And then you open it and then you can actually consume it and experience those effects. Now, the same thing applies to honey. Happen, ha honey happens to be extremely dense. And so it's so dense that really doesn't really get any oxygen in it. So in the packaging of honey, there's always that risk of clostridium uh, botulinum being present there as well. Now, what's the big deal behind this guy? See, this guy is kind of almost the opposite to clostridium tetany. See, clostridium tetany kind of prevents the relaxation of your muscles, so it locks them up. Clostridium botulinum, on the other hand, does the opposite. It relaxes them and prevents them from contracting. So it's the, uh, kind of the other way around. So it prevents you from being able to contract, contract your muscles and pretty much do anything. And so there's two aspects here that we are gonna talk about. Uh, one of the common things that happens in pregnant humans here is that they love honey for some reason. Um, and so if they consume high amounts of honey and it happens to be tainted or contaminated with clustering botulinum, it's quite possible that the bot toxin that they have present enters uh, 
the system and through the blood crosses the placental barrier and enters the child. And so what happens usually at birth is that the child is usually lifted by doctors as you're seeing it over here. It's a very common, very anecdotal type of test in which you kind of suspend the child and see what they do with their limbs. And so most children kind of squirm like no other. They'll start flailing around. They don't like to be suspended that way. But if they've been exposed to uh, Clostridium botulinum, they end up being kind of limp, something called limp baby syndrome. So you can look that one up if you want to. And so this is a very simple way to test that out. Um, however, somebody took this idea of, oh, look, it relaxes muscles into something kind of interesting and particularly kind of silly. So the images that you're seeing on the right-hand side, on the other hand, is probably something that most of you are kind of relating to already. And probably eventually in your uh, longer ages, you might want to pursue something that most of you know as Botox. Botox derives from the same term from the botulinum toxin. That's the Botox portion now being rebranded into something like a treatment. With the same concept of relaxing muscles, you can inject extremely low doses of uh, the bot toxin itself as a way to kind of relax the muscles. And so as the muscles relax, they expand and then they stretch out the skin, therefore kind of giving you this kind of look or impression that the wrinkles kind of go away. So because the muscles are all relaxed, the wrinkles kind of disappear temporarily. This is not a permanent thing. You're introducing a toxin into your body. And this I'm being very uh, specific about. This is not saying, oh, that there's toxins in the air kind of uh, uh, conspiracy theories kind of concept. Here it's literally the uh, Clostridium botulinum produces a wonderful little toxin called Botox and uh, Botox that we've rebranded. And now that guy is used to inject it to relax people's muscles and trigger some sort of uh, cosmetic change. Now, the issue here is again, it's insanely toxic, right? The issue here is that in the picogram amounts of this, it is deadly. Yet humans are choosing on their own voluntarily to inject themselves with this, uh, this amount of toxin. Why? Humans are strange. Yet you'll find them kind of picketing uh, outside stores because they're afraid that their you know, vegetables or meat might be contaminated with some X-ray coli. So the uh, hypocrisy here is very, very high, unfortunately. So anyway, another uh, fun one of the clostridiums that we pay attention to. Now, continuing along with another group of these guys, let's see if we can move on, is another cousin called Clostridium difficile. So here, is this guy is kind of commonly known as C. diff. So for those of you who have ever worked in the field, probably have heard about this. And if anything else, you probably have smelled it. It is incredibly disgusting. And so C. diff doesn't quite hit the muscles in this case. It kind of goes after your intestines. And it kind of starts poking little holes into the uh, lumen of your uh, intestinal wall and causes these very, very severe cases of diarrhea that ultimately can be fatal sometimes. Now, the issue here is that one, for some reason, this particular organism produces this type of diarrheic effect, but it happens to be one, not only uncontrollable, but also incredibly pungent. Its smell is, can be smelled for literally aisles across hospitals and clinics, and it's incredibly difficult to clean off. And so most of the time you end up kind of closing wards simply because of not only you can detect it from the smell, but because the cleaning process, it's kind of heavy duty. So it makes it kind of difficult to, uh, to control and restrict for some reason. And so most of these areas, most of these aisles that kind of get shut off until they can confirm that there's no C. diff around. So if you ever get that experience, since most of you are gonna end up in the health careers fields, you'll probably end up experiencing this guy very good. Now, before I go on, we're gonna give you one last one of the clusterial group and we'll pause there for a quick minute, is a group that is not Clostridium, but still belongs to the same group or classification of them called Veonella. Now, Veonella happens to be one of those unique organisms, again, that is of medical concern. Uh, specifically, its two uh, representatives are called Veonella parvula and Veonella dentacariosi. And if you listen to that last name that I just made, the term dentacariosi means caries or cavities. And so this one happens to be part of that biofilm that we had mentioned in the growth lecture. 
that forms onto your teeth. And so this is part of your regular, regular sorry, oral microbiota. You're part of your microbiome. But every now and then, if this guy overgrows or it outgrows the other ones that are growing in your mouth, it can lead to periodontitis and cavities or caries, if you want to call it officially by its term. So this is the reason why you brush your teeth, basically, and floss, right? So we have this large group of organisms that we're seeing over here that are uh, all of medical importance or even sometimes industrial importance simply because they can form those endospores, okay? So before we move on to the next group of the uh, Firmicutes group and uh, leaving the Clostridial group, Let's take a look at the next organism set, shall we? So one of the groups that I mentioned a little bit earlier that has been reclassified are the mycoplasmas. Now the mycoplasmas used to be part of Firmicutes, but now thanks to uh, DNA and RNA technology, they've now been reclassified into their own phylum called Tenericutes. Now still of medical concern, but slightly different reclassification from what you'll see in your textbooks, currently at least. Now, mycoplasmas happen to be a really kind of cool group because they're insanely tiny. They're probably the smallest cells that we know in terms of uh, morphological size. Um, they happen to be either facultative or obligate anaerobes, but the reason why they're uh, of medical impact for us is because they have a tendency of causing a few, about a third of the pneumonias that we know about and about 10% of the urinary tract infections that are out there. So probably the most infamous of them all and the one that you're kind of seeing down there is mycoplasma pneumonia. Now, what's unique also about it is that it really has no shape. So they don't really have a very strong cell wall, so that makes them pleomorphic. So they end up having all these crazy little shapes, not very kind of spherical, not very circular, not very rod-like. They just take any shape they can. But every now and then, certain strains can have that formation, and they end up develop some, developing something called an organelle tip. Now, remember, bacteria don't really have organelles, right? But uh, more than anything else, they have this kind of little cluster, this little storage space on the side, that ends up looking like this little kind of blob sticking out in which where they can condense the ribosomes and a couple of other um, limited organelles in there too. So for us, medical concern is because of pneumonia more than anything else. Now, proceeding down from the uh, Firmicutes group, we left the Clostridial group, we've looked at the mycoplasmas, let's look at the bacilli, so the ones that are rod-like. And here we're gonna look at several different organisms that are examples or representatives simply because of medical or industrial concern. So the first one is known as Bacillus thuringiensis, which happens to produce a very, very unique toxin called the Bt toxin. So be very careful here, this is not the bot toxin. So there's an O missing here, if you will. Uh, Bt here stands for Bacillus thuringiensis. It's part of its name. And so Bt happens to be one of those very, very, very cool um, forms of environmental use for our bacterium simply because this happens to be a pesticide. And so what happens here is that rather than using synthetic versions that are prepared in the lab, if you will, um, we can exploit the ability of Bt to produce this little crystal called the Bt toxin that normally can land on the leaves of certain crops. And then when pests like caterpillars, for example, come and destroy these large amounts of crops, they actually consume these crystals and they actually die. Now, what's really cool about it, not only are they controlling a pest, but it happens to be very innocuous. It doesn't harm humans in any way, shape, or form. It's not toxic to us at all. And so when they spray it over these crops, it controls pests in a pesticide fashion, obviously, but it doesn't harm us in any way, shape, or form. And it dissolves in water really fast too. So um, there's no issue there. So the reason why we like Bacillus thuringiensis is again, this is now a very natural way of actually controlling, uh, taking care of our crops more than anything else. Now, completely on the opposite side of that spectrum, we look at Bacillus anthracis, which probably from its name, I'm sure you can figure it out, this is where we get anthrax from, right? And um, Bacillus anthracis can be actually, uh, can actually infect you through the skin or through breathing it or through consuming it. Now, interestingly enough, as I'll talk about uh, during our epidemiology 
lectures. We'll talk about the fact that certain ways are more effective than others. And interestingly enough, you breathing bacillus anthracis in or eating it is nowhere, nowhere near as bad as having it land on your skin. So the cutaneous version of that. So um, if you inhale it, if you kind of eat it for whatever reason, you can have these kind of mild effects that are all gastrointestinal or kind of respiratory. But if you actually let it land on your skin, on the other hand, it ends up being anywhere between 1,000 to 10,000 times more potent. And it's able to now do what most people are familiar with is cause anthrax. I'll show you some images in a moment. And then the last group that I'm interested in here is uh, Listeria. And so in particular, Listeria monocytogenes, which happens to be uh, an organism that causes now a disease you've probably heard about in the news called Listeriosis. And somewhere between 1,000 to 2,000 people um, in the United States get Listeriosis every year. So it's fairly constant now. And probably about a good one in five of those usually dies. And so Listeriosis happens to be another GI type of disease, lots of fever, lots of diarrhea, and pretty much similar to most other foodborne kind of diseases. But the issue is that most of the time this guy is rarely diagnosed. People just assume, oh, I had some food poisoning and leave it alone. So it kind of just gets confused with all the other ones like E. coli and you know, bad days at McDonald's. So it rarely goes diagnosed, but we know for a fact that it does occur. And every now and then you'll start hearing these outbreaks pop up um, on a um, nearly, I would say, three to four month basis on the news. Always some sort of a store, some sort of restaurant, somebody kind of reporting, ah, another listeriosis outbreak. And so, um, so I just want to kind of show you the pictures. I actually wanted to show you, for example, the BT toxin itself, these cool little crystals of the toxin that they concentrate, and that's what ends up landing on the crops so they can control the pests. And just wanted to kind of show you a little bit of the destruction of bacillus anthracis or anthrax cutaneously, not inhalationally. And then what Listeria monocytogen is, is these cool little long rods or bacilli that most of you are familiar with. Okay. Now, there is one more group of bacilli that I want to talk about. And this is kind of gets uh, tagged under the other uh, side of this, which happens to be uh, lactobacillus. And so lactobacillus plays a much bigger role simply because it's part of our microbiome. This is part of the guys that exist on us, right? And as a matter of fact, when we talk about the immune lecture, um, I'll share with you a little bit more about those guys. But lactobacillus happens to play a much bigger role for us uh, in the food industry. This is the number one organism utilized for most uh, dairy industries, hence the term lacto that you're seeing there in its name, right? So lactobacillus not only is part of our microbiome, it actually you're, uh, it's, it's transferred uh, vertically from mother to child, usually during uh, lactation also. And lastly, again, more of a food or industry-based concept like producing cheeses and yogurts and things like that too. Now the last little piece uh, that I'm gonna highlight in a couple of steps, no longer being the rod-like ones, now we're gonna look at the circular or spherical ones, conchi, are our streps, our enteros, and our staphs. So here, the reason why we looked at our, our streps and our staphs and our enteros Probably more than anything else, uh, the bigger issues that we have here is a lot of these guys are part of our microbiome anyway. So they live on us and around us without causing very much harm, but they can be opportunistic. And so this is where that whole flesh eating portion popped up to. Uh, Streptococcus pyogenes happens to be one of those. We get to play with those in the lab, for example, right? In which they can actually end up eating uh, the skin from the outside in now, as opposed to gangrene, which is from the inside out. This one's from an external surface. Uh, but normally these guys, you find them everywhere. They're on your skin, they're on your face, they're everywhere, usually not causing very much harm. But in the event that they kind of given the uh, opportunity to do so, they can overgrow and can cause some severe effects. Uh, severe effects, sorry. And these can be anywhere from, like you're seeing an extreme version of flesh eating, uh, uh, necrotizing uh, tissues, but also um, can cause certain skin disorders and things like that, not necessarily related to acne, just so you know. That's a whole different organism. But they can have these effects on your skin as well. 
But probably the one that I'd like to uh, discuss mostly is the enterococcus version of this, another spherical one that happens to live inside your gut. And this guy, unfortunately, even though it also can have some GI distress, lots of diarrhea, that kind of thing, it happens to bring this wonderful little trait called MDR or multi-drug resistant. In other words, there's versions of these cocci, including um, enterococcus in a moment, I'm gonna say this guy too, which is staph, in which they're resistant to antibiotics. And so what happens is that by sharing these, by allowing them to grow or for us abusing things like um, hand sanitizers, which happens to be a thing right now, um, they happen to kind of be opportunistic, they overgrow, they kill other of their competitors in their microbiome, and they can cause some severe diseases. So this is really where kind of our concern becomes that multi-drug resistance portion of staph, of strep, and any of the other cocci that we're talking about as uh, we've been discussing. The concern is that if they start overgrowing and then start developing these drug resistances through these plasmids that we have mentioned before in topic D, there's virtually not gonna be a way to treat them. And so that's really where kind of the medical concern becomes. In the past, a little bit of an antibiotic could do this, but now that they're multi-drug resistant, and we'll talk about how these organisms acquire them much, much later, um, that's where the medical concern kind of relies, okay? So that's pretty much the highlight of all our low GCs. So in a moment, we'll start discussing our high GC content organisms for the rest of the topic. So transitioning into the high GC versions, again, a little bit more of the guanines and cytosines present in their DNA. Now we're gonna look at a phylum called the actinobacteria or phylum actinobacterium, in which there are several different representatives that are kind of useful or important to know. The first of them are the chorini bacteria. And so under this group, we see um, organisms that are also kind of pleomorphic, that also happen to be either facultative anaerobes or possibly even aerobes. But one of the cool things about them is that they happen to um, divide through something called snapping division. And that's usually where kind of a new topic pops up in terms of uh, division, simply because everybody's used to seeing the binary fission. Snapping division happens to be one of those cool ways of seeing things in which they, as they divide, they don't quite separate. And so they end up kind of getting stuck to each other and end up forming these cool little walls. And so what ends up happening is that they look like a cool little arrangement of bacteria all side by side and it looks like a little fence. So that's where that real uh, term kind of comes into place, something called a palisade. So they still divide, they still divide kind of evenly, but they don't kind of separate from each other and they end up having this kind of palisade type formation. Now, the other thing is that they end up being a little colorful. And so they end up accumulating phosphate uh, uh, bodies. And so these are known as phosphate crystals or phosphate inclusions. And so these metachromatic granules end up giving them a little bit of color to them as they're growing and developing. So that's one of the kind of unique pieces. But the reason really why we look at chorionic bacterium more than anything else is what it causes. And so here, what we're looking at is a one particular disease that probably everybody should be familiar with. This is Chorionibacterium diphtheria is the organism and it causes probably the disease that most of you are familiar, especially if you're a parent, called diphtheria. Now, the reason why we looked at, uh, look at diphtheria more than anything else um, is simply because of what it causes to your throat more than anything else and causes your tonsils to get swollen up really, really badly, preventing you from being able to breathe and at some point in time could even kill children. In adults, it doesn't present itself as um, intensive, but it still can happen. Now, for one point in time in our history, diphtheria was actually kind of killing a high population of our children until we developed our first vaccine against it. So for those of you who are familiar with this at the moment, um, diphtheria has its own vaccine, uh, vaccine, and so for those of you who've had children, you know have to, you have to get this wonderful little vaccine called DTaP, which the D in the DTaP stands for diphtheria. So it's part of one of those key vaccinations that everybody has to receive early on, unless you know some of you have some challenges or concerns about it in there, and don't do that for whatever thought processes that you may have. But this is one of those mandatory type. Uh, 
vaccinations that all children should get simply because of this particular disease, which happens to be of high medical concern, right? And so I did want to kind of show you the shape of this bad boy and that little palisade that it forms. So they don't quite kind of separate. And so they end up having these cool little patterns of bacteria kind of side by side form these cool little fences for them, if you will. All right. So diphtheria happens to be one of those important ones under that group. Now, under mycobacteria, the other actinobacterial group that we have in here, here, we also have these kind of tubular shaped guys, but they have this kind of little slight indent in their body. So they have this kind of little bend inside of them. They happen to be all aerobic, um, but they're all what we call slow growers. And so they have a tendency of taking forever to really divide as opposed to most bacteria, hence why it's unique, right? And because of what they have, um, they have these very specialized lipids sticking outside of them called mycolic acids. And more than anything else, uh, those mycolic acids make them very uh, dry resistant or desiccation resistant. But it, because of that lipid, it also makes them very difficult to stain. And so this is something that you guys have been already practicing in the lab, which is where the acid fast stain came into play. So for those of you who remember, you had to boil this guy and steam this guy for 10 minutes before you got it to actually absorb the stain. And this is why mycobacteria have this unique set of lipids called mycolic acids that prevent them from being stained, but also protect them from being dried out. So we heat it with, hit it with heat and steam so they can absorb the stain and we can see it. Now, the reason why we're interested in these mycobacteria more than anything else is because of the two kind of highlights of the organisms that they have, the two main representatives, probably the easiest one to kind of discuss of them all is tuberculosis, right? So mycobacterium tuberculosis is what causes tuberculosis, so I don't really have to kind of expand too much behind that. But probably the more in, uh, kind of rare on the side of the stories of mycobacterium is mycobacterium leprae, which in this case causes something called Hansen's disease or leprosy, which is what most people kind of know what about in terms of colloquial or colloquiality. Now, interesting enough, kind of the story for those who are not familiar with leprosy, uh, mycobacterium leprae has a tendency of accumulating at nerve endings, and so it kind of numbs them out, if not kills them. And so what happens, people, what, uh, that look that you're seeing that everybody kind of talks about leprosy comes as a result of lo losing feeling. And so what happens is these people typically in their limbs fingers, toes, that kind of thing, ears um, and noses, um, because they can't feel it anymore. They have a tendency of kind of uh, receiving a little bit more damage than usual, and they start falling off or rubbing off, if you will, in a very extreme kind of fashion. And so they start losing these uh, tissues. And so what happens is they have these very kind of interesting looks because of losing fingers, hands, arms, toes, ears, and noses. And sadly, unfortunately, it's part of our history in which a certain population of humans decided that that was a horrible punishment by certain deities and the colonies were made to kind of oscillate, isolate and ostracize these populations and they were sent to die. Um, unfortunately, because of their poor understanding and my personal opinion of their idiocy, they didn't understand what leprosy really was and leprosy is very poorly communicated. It's not really transmissible. So in order for you to actually get it, there has to be this extremely high uh, concentration of the organism, but also has to be through some sort of open wound. And so if there's no open wound in which uh, fluids can be transmitted to, anybody with uh, Hansen's disease or leprosy, if you will, can hug you, can kiss you, can you know, be around you without any single possibility or high possibility, I should say, of transmitting leprosy. But because people don't understand it, what people don't understand, they fear. And so still, for example, we, to date, we still have leper colonies in India, for example. And that's just a sad concept where these people, if given access to regular, good old, you know, homemade antibiotics almost, kind of the you know, run of the mill, they could be treated perfectly fine and lead perfectly normal lives. So this is kind of one of those unfortunate cases of what has happened in our history. So anyway, so these are the two main organisms that we worry about in terms of mycobacteria. Tuberculosis, which should be straightforward, and then leprosy or Hansen's disease associated with this guy. And then you guys got to stain a cousin of them called Mycobacterium smegmatis 
in the lab. That's the one that you guys were working with since we don't let you play with tuberculosis, obviously. All right, so then leaving the bacteria, leaving the mycobacteria, we are looking at the actinomycetes. That's another group of high GC organisms that we're interested. And these guys have a plethora of cool things about them. And so uh, there's a bunch of different examples and a bunch of different cool uses uh, that you probably wanna know. So um, actinomycetes all happen to be kind of very long and stringy in terms of their looks. So let me kind of show it to you while we're still here on the slides, right? But there are several of them that have uh, causing certain types of diseases or disorders. Uh, actinomycoses, for example, or caused by actinomyces, or actinomycetes, I should say that correctly, um, can cause certain diseases that cause these cool little uh, blister types formations all over your skin. Um, and so probably actinomyces israeli is probably the one that is known for that too. Uh, its cousin called nocardia causes, can also cause a disease called nocardiosis, very similar to that. Uh, also kind of high in fevers and lots of kind of malaise. But nocardia happens to be present in kind of in the dirt and in water and lake bodies and things like that. It happens to be a really good biorecycler also. So not only it has a medical impact, but it also has an environmental impact behind that too. And then probably, probably the, one of the ones that I'm kind of more interested in, you guys should be familiar with, are the streptomyces versions, the ones that have very long and stringy versions of them, which both have an industrial and an ecological impact. One of them is in terms of what they produce. So the streptomyces are all kind of used um, in terms of producing lots of plastics. So your little water bottles that you are using and even some of the gloves that you've purchased are all produced uh, in the industry by streptomyces, for example. So latex and certain pesticides all come from these guys. So they're really cool, uh, industrially uh, useful organisms. But probably out of more than anything else, an important side of them is because they produce antibiotics also. So streptomyces um, are known as what we call medical generators, simply because they're used to produce high amounts of chloramphenicol, erythromycin, and tetracycline. So these guys are the ones that now, inside uh, industrial labs, generate a lot of the antibiotics that people use on a daily basis. So there's these really, really neat uses behind streptomyces under this high GC classification that we've been talking about. All right. So now we're gonna enter the group of proteobacteria, probably our largest group of them all. Uh, so uh, there's five subclassifications or five classes, which are the alphas, betas, gammas, deltas, and epsilons. And under each of those, there's typically some sort of um, impact impacting, sorry, um, medical or environmental condition that you probably should be familiar with. So for that, we'll move on to our proteobacteria or our largest group of bacteria that we're gonna be studying. 